So before we get into uh, the awards and you know who won uh, the prizes, uh, first we're going to go over the uh, problems and kind of sketches of what the solutions might look like. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, do you see this? Yep. Cool. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, go through these in uh, order of, I guess, what we thought was easiest, most difficult. Uh, so starting off with MCLAN. Uh, so this one was the first one in the list. And kind of the trick to this one was uh, recognizing that you need the first two numbers, uh, but that the third one was uh, kind of just extra information. You didn't have to use it. So you can multiply the first two numbers together, and that would give you the result for the MCLAN problem. Um, and if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, I I'll didn't try even... answer. Oh, what was that? Sorry, that was an accident. Okay. <laughs> so next one was 13 floors. Uh, so this one, uh, you had to use an if statement, determine if the floor was greater than or equal to 13, uh, if it was, or if it's uh, less than 13. So if it was greater than or equal to, then you had to print the number uh, plus one. Otherwise, you printed the number unchanged. Uh, so the trick here was recognizing, you know, what condition you needed in the if statement uh, to, to correctly kind of uh, split the numbers into those two parts. So for rolling the dice, uh, this one was kind of more of a math focused one. Um, so you're given an input in the form of x, d, y plus c, uh, which is common in a lot of like tabletop board games. Uh, and you had to pull out the x, y, and z values. So one way you could do this is if you're using Python or a language with like a split function, uh, as you could split on the uh, d, and then you could split the second, uh, the second half of that on the plus, and that would give you the three numbers. So then once you add all that, uh, you just convert everything to integers. Um, and then plug it into this formula. So s is equal to x plus x times y divided by two. Uh, so you take an average uh, and then add the offset. Okay, next we had uh, tall enough. So this one you had to use a loop uh, to iterate all the numbers. Um, and the trick was detecting if, uh, if you saw even a single person less than 48, uh, then you would kind of jump out of the loop and say uh, false. Uh, otherwise, you have to stay in the loop and recognize that all of them were greater than or equal to 48, and then you would output true. Um, so kind of the trick there is realizing that you wanted to start with your uh, variable set to true, and then in the uh, loop, uh, set it to false. Um, uh, a common problem would be inside of the loop setting it back to true if you see someone that's 48 or greater uh, afterwards. Uh, so avoiding that was important. And let's see what the chat has. Um, okay, so I've got a question about recording. Uh, I think actually um, Sumner is currently uh, going to be recording this and uh, he should have uh, recording afterwards. Okay. Uh, so alphabet soup. Um, so this one you had to take in all the characters uh, and then loop over it to try and detect uh, which ones, if any, were missing. So there's kind of a lot of ways to do this, uh, but one way is to use a set uh, data structure. And for every character in the input list, uh, you add it to the set. Uh, then afterwards, you would take a set that contains the ones you found and a set that contains all the letters. Um, and you could subtract uh, the two sets and you'd be left with the difference. So the uh, letters that were in the alphabet, but not in the uh, soup. So then you could just iterate over that and print them. Uh, another option is you could just uh, iterate over the, uh, the, the soup, checking each letter. Um, and that would also work if you didn't want to use a set. So 
you could see, okay, is there an A and check the entire string? No, it wouldn't work because it has a time limit and your code would be too slow. Oh, that one was caught by the time limit? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure it wasn't based on looking at submissions. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the interesting things is with a lot of these, um, especially as we get farther, they start to be less about just solving it and about solving it efficiently. Um, so yeah, sometimes there are certain things that'll just take too long and it'll mess up the, uh, it'll time out in Caddis. Okay. Um, so tic-tac-toe, um, this one uh, was reading in a 2D list or array. And then one option is since there's only, uh, I think, 16 win configurations, uh, you could just hard code all of those into your code using a lot of copying and pasting. Um, and it would be kind of tedious to solve, but you could solve it that way. Uh, alternatively, you could kind of replace some of those ifs with uh, for loops and try to be more clever with it. Uh, and both of those would work, and they'll both be uh, plenty fast enough. Uh, just a question of uh, how willing you are to copy and paste versus try to find a nice solution with loops. OK, so if we follow the prize, uh, in this case, you need to keep track of which cup holds the prize. Uh, one way you could do this is have a variable that represents which cup the prize is under. Uh, and then for each of the swappings, you check to see if uh, the cup being swapped, the number matches the number for the one that uh, is holding the variable. Uh, and if it does, then you need to update the variable to refer to the other. So because swapping goes both ways, you have to check to see uh, both directions and make sure you swap correctly. Uh, so marble maze. Uh, so this one, uh, the seesaws kind of made it uh, more complicated than uh, if it were just kind of following the following like a, a series of like pipes. So for each of the end marbles, uh, you would step through the maze uh, following the rules for the grid, uh, and you would toggle the seesaw states as needed. So each time you saw a seesaw, um, you could have like a true and false value. So true means uh, it's um, it's currently flipped. False would mean it's not flipped. And if you uh, hit that square and it's false, uh, you would go down the, um, the non-flipped side, and then you would change the variable to true. Uh, and you just had to keep that uh, updated to make sure you didn't forget any cases there. Uh, also in this one and one of the others, uh, the fact that you're on a grid uh, can make indexing kind of a pain because if the marble goes off the edge and you're not careful, you might index past the end of your uh, list or array and that would cause uh, your program to crash. Uh, so for powering tes uh, Teslopolis, so this one is similar in that it's based on a grid. So all of the like indexing problems uh, you have to care about. Uh, but basically you would go for every cell in the grid, uh, like for each row and then every column in them. Uh, you would look at the cell and then check all of its neighbors, including the diagonals, uh, see if there's a power station. Uh, if you find a power station, then you can kind of just keep going. Uh, if you don't see a power station, then you need to add this to the uh, list of things you're going to print. Um, and at the end, there was a specific order, uh, which was uh, you would do the first row and all the columns, and then the next row and all the columns. So depending on how you set up your loop, that was either really natural um, and just kind of the way you iterated through, or it was a pain to convert between the two uh, if you flipped how you represented your grid. Um, so what numeric values, if any, would be used to represent different seesaws? Yeah, so Sam, uh, he's actually the one who wrote this problem. So So does that uh, kind of answer your question? Uh, 
uh, sort of, but I guess what I'm really confused about is um, if if there weren't any specific numeric numerical values, uh, and if you have to use coordinates for this one, um, how would you represent that in the input? So you wouldn't uh, necessarily represent it in the input. Uh, it would be once you read in the input, uh, however you store it internally in your program, uh, that would be kind of up to you. So uh, you could use numbers like zero means non-flipped, one means flipped. Uh, so zero could be left, one is right. Um, and you could toggle it like that. Uh, that's one option. OK, that, that makes more sense, actually. OK, cool. Uh, so this question about now that the problem is over, can I see what cases my program fails at? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's a way for us to reveal that in CADIS. Um, so you're welcome, though. I think it'll still let people submit uh, if you kind of have a, a sudden realization and want to try something. Uh, I think you'll be able to submit, although obviously it won't affect the results of the competition. OK, uh, so quadratic autopilot, uh, this one was basically just a math problem. Uh, so you had to solve for A, B, and C in terms of some input points. Um, and skipping all of the algebra you might want to do to reach this point, uh, you end up with these uh, kind of nasty looking equations. Um, so there's not really too much more to this one. Once you have the equations, uh, putting in the code should be fairly straightforward because uh, it's all just addition, subtraction, like arithmetic stuff. Um, but yeah, the hard part was deriving this, these equations and uh, not making any mistakes, because uh, otherwise it might be hard to figure out where you went wrong. So to do that, um, we, we're given three systems of equations basically with those uh, coordinates. But then does that mean we just solve for, like, like to get to this, would we solve for uh, B first and then A and then C or some other direction, uh, order of derivation? Yeah, um, that sounds right. Um, that's, that's what I did. Um, yeah. And kind of then just wrote A in terms of, you know, the X and Y values and B and then wrote C in terms of the X and Y values and A and B. Um, and since it is a, a set of equations that does have a solution, you're guaranteed that you're going to be able to write it in terms of, um, in terms of the input. You can also do this with a three by three matrix inversion if you hate algebra. Yeah, that's what we did. It worked really well. Yeah, I'm um, just curious, how did you guys invert that matrix then? We used a three by three and then we used Kramer's rule. Oh, okay. Could you like explain that in a in less intelligent speak? Like like uh, Kramer's yeah. rule is a formula that you can use to find the solutions for any system of equations. So what we did was we found code online uh, to implement a three by three using Kramer's rule and then we just used that. Well, any any linear system of equations, which this has. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. Okay. And if you haven't taken, uh, so MINDS does have a class called linear algebra, uh, which will get into stuff like this. Um, so if your high school doesn't have it, then uh, you'll probably take it in college at some point. Okay, cool. Yeah, that was kind of hard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so next up we have Nightwalk. Uh, so in this case, uh, you wanted to use like a breath first search uh, to find the knight's path. So the knight can move uh, in kind of that seven or L shape. Um, so the way you would do the breath first search is you'd make like a queue data structure. Uh, you would take the starting position of the knight, put it in the queue, uh, and then you would start like a loop. So as long as the queue isn't empty, uh, then you're gonna pop off whatever's on the front of the queue look at anywhere it could go, 
uh, and then add those positions to the back of the queue. Uh, and you would keep doing this process until you find, uh, until the knight lands on the space you're looking for. Uh, and then kind of the important part here is that uh, you needed to stop adding new things to the queue, but you had to keep processing what was already on it because you needed to find all of the possible uh, steps. Okay, and then math in another universe. Uh, this was just all about like parsing uh, and parsing can be uh, kind of complicated. This one was a fairly small uh, language you had to parse. So it wasn't as bad, but still kind of hard. So um, what you, uh, as, I guess the most straightforward way to do it would be to start by splitting your input string on all the spaces and having like an array of every, uh, piece of the formula. Uh, and then you could search the input for any plus or minus signs. And when you find them, uh, you could take the plus or minus sign and its neighbors, combine them into a single element or remove, yeah, remove the old stuff from the array. And now you have uh, kind of the result of that computation. Uh, so you keep doing that process until there are no more plus or minus signs. And I do the same thing with multiplication and division. Uh, so you're constantly shrinking the array by removing uh, some of the terms. And then uh, when you're finished, you should just have a single number left. And that's what you uh, want to use. Uh, and then, yeah, in the chat. Um, yeah, so some people uh, that use like Python found out that you could do a search and replace um, and then use the eval function in Python, which takes Python code and runs it. Uh, and after doing the search and replace, Python can just handle the uh, the formulas. So, okay. Um, yeah. So usually, uh, if you sounds like you did the right solution, um, there's a pretty good chance you might have just missed some case, uh, or if it took a really long time, uh, maybe you have an infinite loop or something. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and the last one was delivery driver. So there's kind of a lot on this uh, slide. So this was a problem that required a technique called dynamic programming. Um, so the idea is you have some kind of uh, recursive algorithm. So uh, some kind of uh, like algorithm that depends on like the previous uh, version of itself. Uh, in this case, it would be like the previous day or uh, maybe the next day, depending on if you flipped it. Um, what you would do in dynamic programming is uh, make your uh, kind of the simple solution of just doing the recursion. Uh, you can make it a lot faster by uh, creating like a table. So, oh, I don't know how that screen drawing is happening. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, so you would create like a table. Uh, and so in this case, the table is represented uh, using uh, these indices, so n and c. Uh, and then you would have like a base case. And then every time after that, you would look at uh, the previous uh, location in the table and you would pick like the max from that and then add something else to it. Uh, and that would kind of fill out the table. So you'd work from one side to the other. And then once you reach the other side of the table, then uh, you should have your value in there. Um... Yeah, and so dynamic programming, if it's something you've never heard of before, um, it's definitely covered in like algorithms classes, uh, like at Minds. Um, but it's kind of a technique for solving problems that have a certain uh, kind of shape to them. Um, and other solutions would be like too slow. Okay. 
So that's all the problems. Uh, are there any questions before we get into uh, the, the awards? Oh yeah, actually, uh, will this uh, solution sketch presentation be posted? Yeah, I think Sumner's planning to share uh, his recording afterwards. He can double, let me know in the chat if I'm wrong there. <laughs> okay. Awesome.